What's going on everybody? This is John Jank Gaming on for my here coming at you with a brand new episode of the FCS Dynasty here on NCAA 06 as we got a great episode on tap. Not only do we got eight fantastic games of game action, but we also got some conference standing updates at the end of this episode. So you're going to want to stick around for the entire thing. And if you guys are excited for it, man, make sure you go ahead, smack that like button, hit that subscribe button. If you do happen to be brand spanking new to the channel as well, because we will go ahead and jump right into the first game of action. We got Tulane and Eastern Carolina, some conference USA action. Top 25 teams battling out against each other in Eastern Carolina. They start out firing on all cylinders. Richard Fisher is going to get an early touchdown here. Getting it out to his playmakers as he is the brand new quarterback setting in. Previous quarterback did end up graduating. But this guy, this guy right here, Barrett Haston, he has not graduated. He is back with the squad, and he is doing big things, of course. A 14-0 lead early for the Eastern Carolina Pirates. As now, 14-0 game here. Fisher can extend it, but instead he's going to get intercepted, and he's not going to be able to do anything with it. That is going to be a touchdown for the Tulane Green Wave. You absolutely hate to see it. So that allows Tulane to cut this lead down a little bit as Tulane tries to rally back and make this a football game. And sure enough, we get a good touchdown throw as that boy is going to be gone like a girl in a country song. And sure enough, we are going to see Tulane, the number 22 team in the nation, fighting for their FCS playoff lives right now at this point in the season. They get it down to just a three-point game. A chance to possibly take the lead, but we see an interception. And that is going to be taken to the crib. A very sloppy game that we have seen as well. 24-14 being your score right now. But we've seen a lot of turnovers. Obviously not showing all of the turnovers, but there was a lot of turnovers in this game. I'll have to show you the team stats at the end of this one, but... In between all the sloppiness, we get some flashes of greatness. How about 84 coming up there and making a great play on the football? Sometimes it's just better to be lucky than it is to be good. And that's just a case of, hey, that man was just in the right place at the right time. And so, Eastern Carolina, 17-point lead before going to halftime. But Tulane will eventually go ahead and cut it down to just a 10-point game. It can still go in either direction. So here we go. Second half. Not really seen much change in the score. As Eastern Carolina, they look to go ahead and put this away. Late in the third quarter. Fisher with a ton of time. And he's going to throw a rope right over the middle of the field. And it ends up being caught. Touchdown, Pirates. And Eastern Carolina extends the lead back to 17 points. And how about a curtain call for this Eastern Carolina squad? A direct snap, making some men miss. And it is off to the races. No one's going to catch him from behind. And it does certainly look like it is going to go ahead and be barbecue chicken. As look at that direct snap. Got some good blocks, but... It was mostly this running back that was doing all the work. Barrett Haston, he's a bad man. You don't want to mess with him. As Eastern Carolina, they are going to come out on top. They win this game by the final score of 45 to 21. That's what ends up being the score. And, you know, Tulane, they gave it a good effort, but just could not compete with this Eastern Carolina squad for all four quarters. So Eastern Carolina is going to improve to 7-2, while Tulane, their FCS playoff hopes, they're going to be on live support here, 6-3, and, and especially turning the football over seven times, that's not going to do it either. So here's the hoping that we get a lot less turnovers, we get some cleaner offensive football here in the next game of this episode, where we have Big Ten football action, we got Western Kentucky going on the road and taking on the number 18 team in college football southeast missouri state 
In Southeast Missouri State, they got a lot at stake for them trying to make it back to the FCS playoffs. They were a participant back in year number two, but they were a team that, you know, they're also sitting at the top right now. They got all of these recruits from last year on this defense. It's a very heralded defensive recruiting class. So, but Tyler Johnson actually is hurt for this game. So the custom starting quarterback, he's hurt. And so this defense is going to have to step up. And how about this for stepping up early? Eric Davidson, the veteran, is going to pick up this fumble. And it was forced by none other than true freshman Bam Bam Hendricks. How about that laying down the boom? As that is going to... Give Southeast Missouri State some time, you know, try to get their offense going. But Western Kentucky, even though they haven't done it on the scoreboard, they have been able to move this football a little bit. We're seeing some of that right now. How about this? Good run up the right-hand side. Eventually going to be brought down by true freshman Ken Trill. And he is going to be that last line of defense that will end up at least making his Hilltoppers work for it a little bit more. As we get into the final minute of this first quarter, Porter going to go ahead, throw it to the outside, and it's going to be caught. Touchdown, Western Kentucky in the Hilltoppers. They're going to take the lead here early on the number 18 team in all of college football. This is not a drill. Western Kentucky trying to pull that upset. So now we'll see if Travis Johnson's backup can do anything here as their offense comes back onto the field. And that is one way to get the offense rocking and rolling. Get it out to your star offensive player, Lonnie Scott. One-on-one. -on -one. Crossing pattern works extremely well. And now sitting at almost midfield. We'll see if this offense can make him a little noise now. Dropping back. Looking to the right-hand side. Throws a really nice football. And that is going to go into the end zone. Touchdown, Red Hawks. And an immediate response from Southeast Missouri State is going to be all knotted up at seven apiece here. And that's going to remain the score for a little while. A very defensive-minded game. And we see that defense coming to fruition. As that's what this defense is going to have to do with their one of their best young offensive players. Hurt for a couple of games. This defense is going to have to come through and make some plays. And oh boy, are we getting some plays. So, Southeast Missouri State, they get set up with good field position. We'll see if they can do anything with it. They're going to try to go for it all downfield. And it's caught by Lonnie Scott. Touchdown, Southeast Missouri State. And with 101 left to play here in the first half of action, the Red Hawks are going to seize the lead. So now we'll see if Western Kentucky now can get some clutch stops. Because if this becomes a two-possession game, it could be barbecue chicken. This defense is like that. But like I said, backup quarterback in the game. You never know what you're going to get. Looking for Lonnie Scott downfield. And that actually does end up being intercepted as well. So that does keep the Hilltoppers in this game a little bit longer. We'll see if they can do anything on the offensive end, but they actually end up going free and out, so can't take advantage, unfortunately. As now the Red Hawks take back over, first and 10 from the 46. Dropping back, he's getting a good pocket, works it to the right-hand side, and the defender dives to try to deflect that pass away, but it horribly blackfires as that was the only line of defense nobody is gonna touch him either that's gonna be another touchdown in southeast missouri state they make this the 11 point game and yeah i don't know what the thinking was to be honest but that certainly ain't it chief as now southeast missouri state really starting to get it rolling how about this lonnie scott catching it off the deflection that is big time confidence right there Throwing it in double, triple coverage. I'm pretty sure we got to check this replay real quick to make sure I saw that right. And he was open downfield, but there was a nice job converging. But the Hilltopper still couldn't make a play. As now, Western Kentucky trying to stay in this game. This could very well help a touchdown. 
the Hilltoppers will go ahead, go for two points here, because that will just make it a touchdown and a field goal instead of somehow trying to find a way to get multiple touchdowns against his defense at that point in the game. However, that does end up failing. And with 25 seconds left to play here in the entire game, Gamera Porter, he's going to throw it in the end zone, and that is going to be intercepted once again by the senior veteran Eric Davidson, who is just going to go ahead. He is going to take a knee, and that is going to be barbecue chicken here in this one as Southeast Missouri State is going to win the football game. They win 28 to 16 in this one. And here's the thing about Southeast Missouri State. You know, they don't have the most consistent offense, but their defense will always keep them in the game. I'm pretty sure like the, the one time that we see them lost in gameplay, it was when they scored less than 20 points. So they can get more consistency out of this offense. Watch out, this team could be a dark horse to win the national champion, that's for sure. Speaking of dark horses, though, we got another top 25 matchup here. This one actually being the game of the week. We got the University of Central Florida going on the road, going to the city of brotherly love, taking on the number 11 Temple Owls. But here's the thing about Temple. Temple hasn't played anybody. They really have not. This is their first top 25 matchup of the season, whereas UCF is a little bit more battle-tested considering that they do play against the likes of Oh, I don't know. Georgia Southern, Eastern Carolina, two very good teams. So Lee Corso, he is going to be rocking with the UCF Knights in this one. We'll see if that holds to fruition as very quiet first half here. Still only three to nothing. But then we see some special teams debauchery as we see absolutely no kick return coverage from the Knights. I don't know what it is or what they were planning on doing. You hate to see it as that is going to be a touchdown for the Temple Owls. And Temple's going to take the lead with their new uniforms, those black helmets. They, they're looking really nice if, they, if I say so myself as Temple is not shying away from the moment. I am really surprised to see how Temple is going about handling this game right now. They get another touchdown here, makes it 14-3 at the moment. And this win, if Temple can hang on and win this game, that would be really huge for their legitimacy as an FCS playoff team. They did miss the playoffs back in year number two. And how about this? J intercepting Chuck Dodd and Son Castillo. By the way, this was actually his second interception in the game. We didn't show his first one, but this is the second one taking it to the crib. You already know I got to show it. You always love to see that. Is now first and goal from the two yard line. Dodd under center. Can he get to UCF back in this game at least? Make it to where they could go for the onside kick. They do get the touchdown there. So the touchdown does end up getting scored. They will actually convert the two-point conversion. However, that being said, they fail to pick up the onside kick and Temple. While trying to run out the clock, by the way, they end up getting themselves 28-14. That ends up being that margin of victory here as well. So make sure that the deal gets set in stone as you, Temple wins this football game 28 to 14 being that final score great performance here for the Temple Owls as you know they shut them haters down man Temple it's like I said a team that did not play any top 25 opponents but they hosted one in their home stadium and they got the job done man beating a good Central Florida squad by multiple possessions too that's another thing that shouldn't be misunderstood temple is a solid football team but speaking of solid football teams yes we have yet another top 25 matchup this time we got the number four team in the country rice going on the road in dallas texas taking on the smu mustangs for the battle of the mayor's cut as we do take a quick look at the conference usa 
Western Division standings here. As we take a look and see what's going down. Rice in pretty solid control right now of their own destiny. Not only in a solid position to compete for a national championship. But also not only that. But they are also a football team that is looking to get a top 8 bye. That would be huge for their football program. As now we'll go ahead and see SMU start with the football. And they get off to a really good start here. They get a touchdown pass here early in the game. SMU, they're known to put up points on the board. So this will be an interesting matchup. As Rice, they really like to run the football. We'll see if they can stay with their style of football and win this game. But Robert Johnson, he is going to break one loose here. Triple option. Giving SMU some fits here as no one touches him that was just beautiful blocking on the outside and robert johnson maybe a little bit on the underrated side of things but don't get it twisted he is a very talented quarterback so is this smu qb who throws a dot in the back of the end zone a touchdown for the mustangs as like those horses they got some horsepower on that offensive side of the ball for sure. I think we're going to be in for a fun one. And sure enough, yet another touchdown for Rice. Malone this time powering into the end zone. I'm telling you, we are going to be in for a shootout potentially. As Brandon McCarty, he's going to have to bring his A game. Already got two touchdowns. Looking for a third in the back of the end zone. It ends up being caught. Touchdown, Mustangs. 21 to 14 ends up being your score at this point and man did brandon mccarty bring it he's already got three touchdowns here in the first half and not only that his special teams they might mess around and give him a little bit of help here gets the catch it's not a fair catch and rice has a lapse in judgment in their punt return coverage and that is going to be a 74 yard touchdown return how about this SMU taking it to the Rice House, the number four team in the country. As SMU, they're already four and three. They really need this victory as that is going to be caught for a touchdown. As now, first and 10 from the 13-yard line late in the first quarter as Johnson gets it out to the outside. He's going to pitch it out. To the middle of the field, and it's going to be in the end zone. Touchdown, Rice. As Robert Johnson is going to pitch it out, and that is going to be yet another score. So that takes us into the fourth quarter of action. 28 all being your score at the moment. As now, McCarty drops back, looks to the left-hand side, throws it up for his receiver. One-on-one. -on -one. And that is going to be a touchdown for SMU. 35 to 28 is going to be your score at the moment. As McCarty, he was going to take a shot whether he released that football or not. So kudos to him for hanging in there. And now Rice is on the ropes. They need a response. Johnson breaks one tackle. Gets away from a second one. Just long enough for Robert Johnson to get yet another touchdown on the board. And now it's 35 all. Two minutes left to play. McCarty with another drive. This time trying to lean on his running game, but there's a fumble. Rice is going to recover, and all of a sudden, it is going in literally the exact opposite direction. Touchdown, Rice. Alvin Colvin with a 98-yard touchdown as the Rice Owls make this a seven point game. And now McCarty finds himself down, facing some intense pressure. And that running back, let's be real, he is straight folding right now. You absolutely hate to see it. As it's been a really good game, you can't even blame that on Brandon McCarty. You gotta come down and make that catch and try to make some things happen for your quarterback. And just from that point, it looked like Rice they were taking control of this game. We're seeing that right there as three touchdowns scored in less than a, not even in a couple of minutes. It might have been one full minute of game action. So Rice takes control here. 21 point lead. Now SMU, they're 
They're not going to go down without a fight. They will get one more touchdown up on the board. SMU, they do get that 50, uh, 40 burger. So it's a good perform offensive performance as well. But, you know, some key mistakes there towards the end. Seals the deal in Rice. Rice is going to be undefeated. 8-0. Meanwhile, SMU, they are going to fall to 4-4 four four on the season. Serious danger of missing the FCS playoffs here. For the first time in this series, I believe they made the playoffs both year one and year number two. So if that's the case, that will be the first time that they would miss out on the FCS playoffs if that holds up. So we've seen some good college football action so far, but let's go ahead and check out the round the FCS to see what we're stepping in in terms of early action. We start off in the WAC Conference as New Mexico State goes on the road to play up against Stephen F. Austin and the Aggies do bounce back. They win 52-20 on the road and that will bolster their record up to 6-1 on season number three. As for Ball State, they actually blow the doors off of Southern Illinois as the Cardinals, they take what has been a dis depressing season for them. They win 38-3 on the road as the Saluki still desperately searching for that first win of the season. This blowout is not going to help. Speaking of blowouts, we got the Akron Zips blowing out Illinois State. The Redbirds pulled off a nice upset last week, but it will not be happening two weeks in a row as Akron will prove to 8-1 and one as a number seven team in the nation proves why they have that in state. Kent State, meanwhile, the defending national champions cr cruising through the MAC conference action, although they do get a challenge from Indiana State. The Sycamores put up a good fight, but still end up losing 25-18. As for the number one team in the nation, we got some rivalry game action in Orono, Maine. And the Maine Black Bears were very close to pulling off the upset. They lose 29 to 23 versus the number one team in college football, New Hampshire, as the Wildcats improved to 7 and 0, while Maine almost winning the ACC last year, falling back to earth. They're now 2 and 5. So we get to the second half of FCS gameplay action here as we go to the ACC conference. We got the number three ranked James Madison Dukes going on the road and taking on a team that has been battle part in ace. North Carolina A&T State six and three. They still have not had a single bye week. I thought that was really interesting to think about. But, you know, North Carolina a and they have given some teams some scare this year. And, you know, could be a team that makes it the FCS playoffs still. But they need this win right here against the number three team in all of college football. And it's going to have to start with finding a way to contain David Thorne. He is a bad, bad man. True sophomore. He is built different. Matter of fact, this receiving core... Reminds me of the Cincinnati Bengals trio, man. It is a special group, even though they haven't put it together on the field this season yet. But midway through the first quarter, only 3 nothing right now as Stephen Rogers is going to throw it downfield. And look who it is. It's David Forn who's going to come down with the catch. Nice little out route. Just throw it right to where only his guy can make the catch. And Stephen Rogers is going to finish that drive off. Touchdown, James Madison. And they will take an early 10 to nothing lead here. As how about getting that tight end action going here? All of the eyes going towards the quarterback. As now, later on in the game, BJ Bowers getting a little bit involved. He's going to get a nice easy run. And there is the problems that North Carolina AT is starting to have. They are starting to get that injury bug a little bit. And it's going to be exacerbated by that injury on their defensive front. So now it's 17 to nothing. And they got their quarterback, Travis Byers, in the game. Senior quarterback experience. But I don't know if he has the same talent level as, um, as Smoke James. We did see pieces of Smoke James. Custom prospect, true freshman as well. They went with Travis Byers. It was a close battle in the spring. Um, but that being said, through that interception, you hate to see it. And now James Madison gets an extra possession in what's been an already potent day. And that is going to continue here as we are going to get the crumb bucket going. As Kevin Crumb is going to come down and make a catch. 
as that will end up going into the end zone. Tut! Well, not in the end zone, but maybe it will get in there soon as they are in the, not in the end zone, but in the red zone. And Stefan Rogers sets his feet and throws it downfield, and it's incomplete. Trying to get it out to the true freshman bread. Brad Aldrowsey is deflected away at the last second. So now it's third and 10. Rogers will drop back the pass once again. Looks to his left. Gets it out to David Forn. And David Forn, here's the amazing thing about him. He's a big guy, but he runs like a gazelle. Absolutely graceful carrying that football. We saw it right there running away from the smaller defender. And that's going to be another touchdown for James Madison. Made it 24 to nothing as Rodgers continues to be in his bag right now. This time, trying to go deep with the football. And David Forn, ladies and gentlemen, how about putting on a show? He's out here shredding the North Carolina A&T off defense. It was, it's been absolutely magical to wa watch right now. Having a breakout performance. And we still got a half of football left to play. And BJ Bowers... He's built different. He's built different, breaking some tackles, and he's on the way into the end zone. Touchdown, Dukes of James Madison, 38 to nothing. As the Aggies, they had him locked up. They had him brought down for a minimum game, but somehow managed to find a way to get out of there still. As now, Rodgers driving back the pass. He's going to look to the right-hand side. He's going to get it out to... The tailback, B.J. Bowers. And B.J. Bowers gets himself yet another touchdown. 45 to nothing being that score at the moment as Rodgers gets it to Bowers. And you'll absolutely love to see it. So James Madison putting up a dominating performance. 58 to 7 ends up being your final score as James Madison is now on a five-game winning streak. But now we get into some rivalry game action as we shift on down to the SEC as Furman is going to come out here, go on the road and take on the number six team in the entire country, Georgia Southern coming on to the football field. As we take a look at Ikeda Woods, look, Ikeda Woods, he's not much of a passer. They do not pass the football very often in this offense. But man, can he run the football? And we see some of that here. No, wait a minute. I just jinxed it. Furman gets the fumble recovery. Let's go, man. It is now going to be... Well, Furman had a chance to make something happen. But, you know, they couldn't do anything with it. Ikeda Woods takes over. And now we're back to what I'm used to seeing. Ikeda Woods... Taking it to the crib. 79-yard touchdown, by the way. As that's what Ikeda Woods does, man. He makes some guys miss, and he can run away from defenders with ease. He's only 5'6". I don't know if he'll get a shot at the quarterback position specifically, but he deserves a spot in the NFL. But he's not really showing person right now, as that is going to be recovered once again by the Furman Paladins. As Furman is looking to play tough right now. As now, second and four coming up. We're going to the outside. We got some space. We're going to get it out. And it's going to be a first down once again. As now, here we go. St. Poe looking to make some things shake. He had a huge game back in year one. We'll see if he can help lead the comeback. But an un. Wise decision, though. And now Furman is going to take over. First turnover of the day for the Furman Paladins. And what was a somewhat promising drive for University of Furman. It just does not end up that way. But now we go into the second half. Second half going to go ahead. And we're going to see first and 10 from the 46-yard line. Ikeda Woods dropping back. He's actually going to try to pass the football. Actually finds Miniachi. And Miniachi is going to come down and make the catch 100 yards in the air. Now, or at least 100 yards of total offense. We'll see if this is, can get this Georgia Southern offense going. And finally see them pull away from this game. This is a lot closer than what we're expecting. And Ikeda Woods turns the football over. 
And not only does he turn the football over, it's going to go straight to the crib. And all of a sudden, guys, we are talking about a tied football game at the moment. Are you serious right now? And here we go. Fourth quarter. Oh, my goodness. Things are getting really interesting right now. As Furman is going to take the lead in the fourth quarter. How about this? The Paladins potentially with the upset of the season as Love throws a dime right downfield. As now, 14-10 to 10 game. Still with less than a couple of minutes left. Georgia Southern needs to score a touchdown here. Otherwise, they're going to take a very shocking loss here. But they start to wake up a little bit. Ikeda Woods throws a really nice pass down the football field. As now going ahead and seeing Ikeda Woods go to work. As here we go. Woods dropping back. Looks over to the left-hand side. Gets it out and would go ahead and get it inside the five-yard line. Trying to get pressure on Ikeda Woods, but they're not in a pass rush kind of mentality. This is a team that runs the football heavy. We'll see if they go to that running game once more. Woods fakes the pitch to the fullback. He's going to take it into the end zone himself. And with a minute left in the game, that's going to be a touchdown. And Georgia Southern, they are going to hang on. And they are going to win the football game as the Eagles escape one. Furman gave them a scare. It was a really serious scare. Let's be real now. And still, they fall just short. As now, Georgia Southern, they do improve to 7-1. While Furman, you know, Furman, they, they took a loss that they were going to expect. But got to give them kudos for making this game a lot closer than anticipated here. Uh, in this uh, rivalry matchup. Speaking of games that are brewing rivalry games, we got North Dakota State taking on the Grizzlies of Montana as we got the thumbnail matchup between the number five team in the nation and the number 17 team. Thought this could have been a matchup that could have very well been a game of the week, but you know, the NCAA game itself did not feel that way. You, you hate to see it because I disagree with that. So, that being said, lots of things at stake here. Montana and North Dakota State, they are both in the hunt for that conference championship. To get that, at, that automatic qualifier, Montana, they needed a little bit more because they are on the bubble as an at-large, while North Dakota State, unless there's an absolute collapse, they should make it to the FCS playoffs. Even though they did underperform once they get there over the past couple of years. But this defense that North Dakota State has, it is legit. Only allowing around 150 yards a game. Absolutely insane stuff. We've been seeing some great things. As now, dropping back the pass is going to look downfield. As that is going to be caught somehow. Did I just jinx this defense? I might have just went ahead and done that as Travis Slaughter is going to throw an absolute strike down the sideline here. And that is going to be a huge gain. And now Montana is going to be set up with some potential to go ahead and take the lead. And sure enough, Travis Slaughter is going to take it into the end zone early. And the Montana Grizzlies at home making some things shake, man. Taking that early 7-0 lead. And we'll see if Montana can build a big enough lead. That's the key to pulling the upset on the Bison. Because I'll tell you what. We know that North Dakota State, they are more than capable of pounding you on the ground. But that aerial attack is looking a little bit questionable. So if Montana can get them a little bit comfortable from a game script perspective, that will give them a huge boost in terms of their chances of victory. And this will certainly help that cause. Nice run. Up the right hand side, that is going to go for a first down here, as that will end up putting Montana in solid field position as we get, get it going with the second quarter. But then Travis Slaughter gets it out to the fullback, and the fullback is going to fumble it here, and the big fella is going to scoot 
He's going to rumble. He is going to stumble his way into the end zone. Touchdown, North Dakota State. And this game is all knotted up all of a sudden. Certainly did not see that coming, especially with Duchesne, a defensive lineman, able to go ahead and run away from the offense at least long enough to where he was able to be comfortable and get into that end zone. You love to see it as now interesting concept here but montana does get another touchdown on the board so that fumble that they had that led to a touchdown is not going to rattle them at least not that much as travis slaughter will go ahead and get his second touchdown of the game nice job fitting it right over the the corner so a 14 to 7 lead here but can montana hang on for all four quarters it's not looking that great though as we see a huge sack, Travis Slaughter taking a shot. He saw it coming too. As now leads the third down. Got to get it out to the running back, but it's going to be picked off. And it's going to be taken back to the crib. Touchdown, North Dakota State. As Aaron Whitehead is going to get the pick six. And now all knotted up. Does North Dakota State start taking control? Anderson. Gets a couple of missed tackles, dives into the end zone, and now we have the Bison that are going to be taking the lead right here, right now. Anderson making some things happen, and it's a 21-14 lead. So now Travis Slaughter and company finds itself down for the very first time, trying to set up a screen, but that's going to be fumbled once again, North Dakota State is going to get their hands on the football. We do see Dom Pedro Alexander, the sophomore custom recruit. He is going to at least make the tackle. But once again, the Bison find themselves in the red zone. But there's another fumble. And Montana is going to recover that. So late in the third quarter, things are getting a little bit on the sloppy side. Things are not looking that great at the moment. So we'll see if Montana can take advantage as now. Second and short after the fumble. Slaughter trying to throw it over in the middle, but it ends up getting tipped at the line of scrimmage. And that will also end up being intercepted. So North Dakota State, they don't pay for the mistake that they had in the red zone. Matter of fact, they're going to get an additional red zone opportunity because of that particular turnover. 4-1, by the way, by Montana. As now, Ferguson... Gonna play it safe, gonna just toss it to the outside. Let your star tailback do the rest of the work. And sure enough, he certainly does that. 28 to 14 now being your score. As ever since Montana took the lead, it is going to be a two-score lead. As we got 3.30 left to play in the ball game. Travis looks to the left hand side, but it's gonna be intercepted. It's intercepted there as well. Just a nightmare scenario right now for the Montana Grizzlies as they're trying to play themselves back in this game. And now all of a sudden, Montana is the team that's looking uncomfortable right now as they're forced to, you know, do a little bit more of what they're not used to doing. And now North Dakota State, not only can they pin their ears back, but they can also run this football free 20 left to play in the entire game. But maybe they won't get a chance to run too much clock out because Ken Anderson, he's going to find yet another crease in the defense. And it's exposed in a big way, 57 yards. And I'll tell you what right now, you guys, you can absolutely hear a squirrel fart in this stadium right now as Anderson is going to be in to the end zone. Touchdown, Montana. Or not Montana. Touchdown, North Dakota State. Montana looking down horrendous. As we get to the last minute of this game, Montana's cannot score in their next possession. So, should be, a, you know, be able to run the clock out. Maybe you need it a little bit. But they're going to run it with the fullback. And look at this. The fullback is going to get involved, you guys. Montana gets crushed here in the second half and north dakota state they are going to win the football game 42 to 14 is going to end up being your final score here for the most part it, it was a little bit closer than you know what the scoreboard says but you know all things considered 
you you hate to see it you really do hate to see it north dakota state they run away with it in the second half and now north dakota state they put themselves in even better position in order to go ahead and clinch that pac 10 conference championship and get that automatic qualifying bid to go to the fcs playoffs for the third time in this series within three seasons montana however looking suspect so for the final game of this episode we got yet another rivalry game we're getting some great rivalry action here in this week as we got number 19 ranked texas southern they're gonna be hosting arkansas pine bluff now interesting thing about arkansas pine bluff they are you know in the race for the northern division texas southern they can't go to the fcs playoffs this year due to ncaa sanctions but that being said always love a chance to take a look at Roderick murray he is one of the most electric running backs in the country if he's not a first team all-american at the end of his season i will legitimately fight somebody i i don't care um if it's somebody at ea sports you know it is what it is but arkansas pine bluff is gonna take the show early as starting this game they're gonna silence this crowd a little bit a 91 yard touchdown and the golden lions with a seven nothing lead so putting a little bit of pressure right away as aaron valentine he's gonna get in there and get the sack breaks a double team as well how about that for a hard hit so now seven nothing game here is adam mayhew off the second and 17 but he's gonna go ahead and pick up the first down anyways big time throw there by adam mayhew he's not somebody that throws very often in this offense this is you know centered around roger murray let's be real but mayhew is doing some good stuff here early in this game and you know throwing it to where his receivers can make plays as we get another big time throw down the middle of the field you got to be accurate when all that traffic as Mayhew with a chance to score on his own and he's going to do that Solomon West the custom prospect he's gonna find the end zone touchdown Tigers and it's all knotted up here seven all game and we got to see a Roderick Murray highlight Murray down the sideline touchdown Tigers as we knew Roderick Murray he was gonna get involved in this offense at some point and how about that getting a convoy down his way and he had all that open space in the world so 14-7 game here is now we go ahead and take a look at Niall Matthews he's gonna throw one over the middle of the field he finds the back of tight end and that's gonna be caught for a touchdown too you love to see it so a close game here as we get into the final couple of minutes here of this first half Mayhew looks to the right he finds Roderick Murray stunning on these hoes and he's gonna find the end zone touchdown Texas Southern 21 to 14 as Mayhew he was facing some intense heat right there but was still able to get that pass off as we get into the last couple of seconds here of this first half we'll see if Arkansas Pine Bluff can they rally Matthews looks to the right inside but it's gonna be intercepted it's gonna be picked off that is major trouble here as Sean Green gets his third interception here of the season. He has been a ball hawk, and we know Texas Southern, they are built to win these big games. They pulled the upset on James Madison earlier this year, and that is huge in order to preserve this lead going into halftime. And look at this. We do end up seeing Texas Southern receive the ball to start the second half. And Roger Murray is going to make him pay for it right away as we will end up seeing the Texas running back fall his blocks. And that's, while it's not a touchdown, it does go for a very significant game, making these defensive backs tackle in the run game and just making them real. They are really hurting right now as his backup running back, Roger Murray, he's going to get a little bit of a breather. He's also going to find the end zone. They have one of the best running back duos in the country here at the fcs level and it's now going to be a 28 to 14 lead as arkansas pine bluff is letting it slip away here a little bit we'll see if the golden lions can come up with a spark here and sure enough 
We might have that now as he, this man right here, sick and tired of hearing all the talk of Texas Southern, let it be known like, hey man, Alfred, he's gonna make some things shake as well. But are we gonna see a back-to-back -back like we are in a Drake song? Right after the kickoff return for Arkansas Pine Bluff, we see Solomon Les trying to get loose, but then he fumbles the football. And Arkansas Pine Bluff is gonna recover the Golden Lions with a chance to tie this game. 22 going down the sideline got some space to scoot it's not no it is going to be a touchdown he remains in bounds as the white pal breaks one tackle gets down the sideline one man left to beat gets away from him stiff arms a second defender while we're at it and it's untied ball game now later on in the third quarter doug rose back in to protect his quarterback he's gonna let it loose into the end zone touchdown golden lions and we officially have a lead change here folks Tompkins going up and making the snag trusting his guys to make a play and the freshman quarterback has officially given the lead but that being said they still gotta find a way to contain Roderick Murray and Roderick Murray man let me tell you what he is a huge problem right now smash woods misses the initial tackle and that leads to a ton of yards downfield he tries to get back into the play though but Texas Southern now threatening again Mayhew looks downfield he wants it all he wants to tie and he's gonna get the tie touchdown Texas Southern and that is going to make this a nice little lead here 35 all as we will go ahead and see uh some, some very interesting stuff now Arkansas Pine Bluff they had a chance to win this game Doug Rose once again does not get to carry he's healthy he's perfectly healthy but took a break there no that was Doug Rose Doug Rose fumbles the bag matter of fact he fumbles it, and it's now tie ball game, and we're going to go right into overtime. Pine Bluff, they did receive the football first, but they couldn't do anything with... Well, no, actually, Texas Southern, they start with the football, and Adam Mayhew is going to go ahead and start the overtime period with a touchdown. So the pressure now on Arkansas Pine Bluff, who did decide to go on defense first, throws it over the head of Jacob Brightman. And here we go. Arkansas Pine Bluff. They need something to shake here. It's not looking good. They try to run it up the middle with Doug Rose, who has, you know, he's been having a good game besides that fumble, but that's not something you love to see. A fourth down, 14 yards you need to pick up, and you got a freshman quarterback. Matthews drops back. He's going to throw it, trying to target one of his receivers, but he overthrows him. Texas Southern is going to end this game on an interception. And Arkansas and Pine Bluff, they gave it all that they had. That's the beautiful thing about these rivalry games, man. Rivalry week, one of the funnest things in all of college football. And hopefully something that this realignment that we're seeing in modern college football. This was recorded, of course, in 2022. So if you're watching this in another year or something, you know, well, hopefully my uh, prediction doesn't come true, but man, we had ourselves a really exciting football game. Texas Southern, they had to do what they needed to do, and ultimately they did end up going ahead and getting the job done. And heartbreak for Arkansas Pine Bluff, as they would have really loved that win in order to give themselves a leg up here in the Northern Division race, but... They're certainly still in the thick of things, so it might not be the last that we see this Arkansas Pine Bluff squad this season. Now, before we go ahead and check out the conference standings as we move into week number 11, let's check out some other games throughout the FCS that we didn't get to see that did end up happening in the late afternoon as well as early evening. We start with Western Carolina. They played host to Alabama State as Coach Ben Field leads the Catamounts over Alabama State 52-42. However, we do get some trouble for Idaho as the Idaho Vandals are going to fall to Arkansas State 31-28 being that final score, which could move Idaho down significantly in the polls. 
As for Sam Houston State, they take care of business against Appalachian State. As Sam Houston State, the Bearcats win 35 to 21, and they are going to be able to extend their stay in the top 25. As for San Diego State, the Aztecs continue for winning streak in the regular season as they continue to plow through the Mountain West, beating Southern Missouri State 37 to 14 on the road. Buffalo, meanwhile, does the same thing in MAC action as they take on the sub 500 Ohio Bobcats. Buffalo winning a close one, 24 to 17, in order to improve to five and two. As for UNLV, they will actually be dropping out of the top 25, or at least that would be what I would be expecting as they lose to Northern Iowa in conference play, an overtime shootout, but Northern Iowa prevails, winning 40 to 37. Central Michigan, however, will not have that same problem as they absolutely demolish the leverbacks of Western Illinois. Central Michigan winning their game 48 to 10 to remain in the top 25 convincingly. Meanwhile, Mid-Tennessee State is now at number 23 in the country, and they could very well hop up higher as they do take care of business against Florida International. The Blue Raiders win this one 38-16 in Sunbelt action. So now we find ourselves in the home stretch here in season number three of the FCS Dynasty. And because of that, I wanted to go ahead and take a deeper dive into the conference standings and some conference races to definitely keep an eye on. We'll get started here, starting with the Atlantic Division for the ACC right now. South Carolina State is on top with that 5-2 record. But that being said, keep an eye on Delaware as well. They are right behind them at 4-2 in the conference. Florida A&M also hanging in there. They could sneak in towards the end. 3-3 three three right now, but they will probably need to win their next couple of games if they want to have any chance of going to the good old-fashioned conference championship game. However, as of right now in the Coastal Division for the ACC, things feel pretty locked up. New Hampshire, they are 5-0 as of right now. And if James Madison loses another game, they have no chance of catching up. Even then, New Hampshire, they will need to lose two of their next three conference games in order to go ahead and not make it to this conference championship so far. But right now, New Hampshire does control their own destiny. As for the Big Ten Conference, as of right now, Southeast Missouri State is sitting on top with a 4-1 conference record as well as the highest ranked team in the entire conference. But there's some teams that are also in the mix. Eastern Kentucky is also doing its thing right now, 4-2 overall in the conference. And then sitting at one game back, we got Eastern Illinois, solid season for the Panthers, as well as Tennessee Martin, which they will get a crack at Southeast Missouri State in the next episode that will be one of the nationally televised games that we will go ahead and take a look at. As for the Big 12 North, so the Big 12 has an interesting caveat. I'm going to talk about the South real quick first, uh, even though it wasn't in alphabetical order. Uh, so Texas Southern and Western Carolina, they are both under NCAA probation. Because of that, and because the penalties that I want to enforce on schools in the FCS Dynasty, none of these teams are eligible for the FCS playoffs. So let's say Texas Southern or Western Carolina, they end up going to the conference championship game. In that case, whoever wins the North Division would automatically win the automatic bid for the Big 12 Conference since neither, like I said, Western Carolina or Texas Southern get a chance to make it to the FCS playoffs. So, that being said, things in the North, extremely tight right now. Four teams that are still realistically in it. As of right now, we got a three-way tie for first place. Chattanooga, Arkansas Pine Bluff, who... We just saw there towards the end, heartbreaking loss to Texas Southern. Grand Wing State is also in the picture as well, 5-3 overall with a 3-2 conference record, so some solid teams. And then Jackson State is hanging in there as well, 4-4, four 2-3 four, conference record right now. They're just one game back, so four teams that do have a realistic shot of winning that Big 12 automatic bid. As for the Ivy League, as of right now, it is looking like it is going to be a two-way race here. As right now, we have a tie for first place. We have the Penn Quakers, who are 5-3 and three right now, 4-1 and one in the conference. And then Yale is also in here as well. 
They also possess that 4-1 conference record. Hope we get to see these two teams play at some point so that we can really get a clear picture of who gets that Ivy League bid. But it looks like someone other than Brown could very well be going to the FCS playoffs. Over in the Conference USA, as of right now, two-team race with Eastern Carolina having the advantage. They do have the tiebreaker over the Knights of University of Central Florida. Unless Eastern Carolina loses another conference game, it looks like Eastern Carolina would go ahead and move on to the conference championship. But in the West Division, they're going to have a tough opponent potentially. Rice, they are having in a historic year. Undefeated still, 8-0 with a 6-0 conference record. And, you know, they seem to be pretty much a lock at this point. No other team in, in the West Division is even close uh not even within one game of the rice owls at least as of right now for the ia independent schools not much going on here two three teams that could uh make it out of the independence of course we know about temple they're currently ranked but umass has a pretty solid record and then rhode island's doing pretty solid as well we'll see if rhode island or umass can sneak into the fcs playoffs up next we do have the mac conference and we go to the east division first as of right now, what we are looking at is Akron sitting on top at the moment with the defending national champions, Kent State. One game behind, but looking pretty safe to get an at-large bid, sitting at number 11 in the country. Looks like it could come down to the battle of the wagon wheel to see who makes it to, the, to Ford Field for that MAC championship game. Over on the west side, a little bit of a surprise here. We got Western Michigan sitting on top. They are with a 4-1 conference record, but it's very tight at the moment. We also have Central Michigan, Eastern Michigan, and then Ball State that are all up in there within either half a game or one game back. So still a lot to go ahead and uh, settle in this Western Division. Uh, we'll, it will be very interesting to see if Western Michigan can hang on and find a way to make it to the conference championship game in the MAC Conference. Over in the Mountain West, things look pretty locked down as of right now. San Diego State, number two ranked team in the nation. They have a one and a, actually a two game lead over the two teams behind them, both Southern Missouri State and Northern Iowa. Unless there's an epic collapse, I see San Diego State once again claiming a conference championship here in the Mountain West. As for the Pac-10, things are getting very interesting here. We got Sacramento State, they're 5-0 as of right now. Two other teams that are in the mix. We got North Dakota State, 4-1 in conference action. That loss to Montana State could be a big deal, but listen, North Dakota State, they're playing against Sacramento State in the next episode, so we'll definitely see that. That could very well determine who wins the Pac-10 Conference Championship because Weber State also is under two-year probation so even though they are in the hunt for the conference championship they are also not eligible to make it to the fcs playoffs so you absolutely hate to see that so realistically two team race for that automatic bid could very well be decided in the next episode as for the sec east we see georgia southern pretty much locking things down at the moment undefeated they got a two and a half game lead over to citadel so i see georgia southern possibly representing for the sec once again through that automatic bid but on the west side things are a little bit more interesting i i'm really curious to see how things shake out four teams that are still in realistically in play we got sam houston state on top right now 20th ranked team in the nation they're four and two Meanwhile, Southeastern, they're not ranked in the top 25, but they are receiving votes and are also in play. They play against Georgia Southern in the next episode, so we'll check in on that game. In addition, we got Northwestern State, 3-2 and two in the conference, and they will be taking on Appalachian State. So if they take care of business, they can strengthen their position as well as they are half a game back. Finally, just one game away in Furman, almost pulling the upset in georgia southern in this episode alone the paladins are four and four overall three and three in conference just one game back we will see Furman play against on the road against mcneese state so we'll see if Furman can bounce back and keep themselves alive but a very interesting race here in the sec west 
over here we got the sun belt and not really too terribly much to talk about right now we got a one and a half game difference between mid tennessee state and the rest of the conference i do see mid tennessee state going to the fcs playoffs they don't get an automatic bid but mid tennessee state would shouldn't need that anyways uh they'll probably be the only team from the sun belt that goes to the fcs playoffs this year and finally, we got the WAC Conference. Now, the WAC is an interesting place right now. There's a three-way tie. We got Utah State, 4-1 conference play. They're not ranked. Idaho is also in there as well, number 19 team in the nation. They just lost to Arkansas State. So, in terms of an at-large bid, they are right on the bubble at the moment. So, just to make sure that they get in, they're going to need to win that conference. So, these next couple of games are going to be important. Speaking of importance, New Mexico State is still in there. 6-1, 4-1 in conference play, but they lose to Idaho. So, New Mexico State, they play against St. Thomas. They need to rack up these wins and then hope for, for Idaho to lose since they had that tiebreaker to work against them. And speaking of things that could uh, be interesting, Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts now is still in the picture. 5-4 overall. They got a 4-3 conference record. This is a solid team. This is a team that's a little bit on the rise. They're taking on Utah State in the next week here. And if Utah State loses to Oral Roberts, the Golden Eagles make the FCS playoffs? I don't know, man. We'll, we'll have to wait and see what's going on over here at the WAC. It's just a very interesting development. Oral Roberts, a little bit of a long shot, but you never know in this crazy world that is college football. So that's going to wrap things up here for week number 11 action. And it's been some fun NCAA action that we got going on. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the FCS Dynasty. Next time out, we will have week number 11 going over not only some nationally televised games, but also some games that are going to have direct impacts on these various conference championship races that I just highlighted. So all that being said, I hope you guys are really excited for it. And if you are, I need you guys to do me a massive favor. Smack that like button. Hit that subscribe button as well if you do have to be brand new to the channel. And like what you see as well. But with that, this is John Jay Gaming on the mic signing off. I'm hoping you're all out there having a good one. Take care, everybody.